Okay, so this is lecture two in gastrointestinal system in physiology. So physiology of hunger and satiety. So hunger and satiety. These are the two mechanisms that will regulate the food intake. How much food you're going to eat at a particular time, how much time you take for you to feel hungry again to eat another meal. So that is controlled by hunger and satiety. So in the brain, there is an, a location which is called the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is the one that is involved in regulation of automatic function of the body. So when you're talking of autonomic nervous system of the body is mainly controlled by the hypothalamus. So when it comes to hunger and satiety or satiation, if you want, that is being controlled by the hypothalamus. So a hypothalamus is a cluster of nuclei. So there are a lot of nuclei within the hypothalamus that are responsible for a lot of things. Already, <clears throat> when we start looking at the endocrine system, you realize to say that the hypothalamus is also responsible for the production of certain hormones, which are called uh, releasing hormones. So the hypothalamus, they are producing releasing hormones that will go to the pituitary gland to stimulate the production of other hormones. So there is control. So you find that the hypothalamus is involved there. But on top of that, we have two nuclei that are involved in hunger and satiety. So we have the lateral hypothalamic nuclei or the hypothalamus that is involved in hunger. So they are called the hunger center. Then the ventromedial nucleus is called the uh, <clears throat> satiety center. So we'll discuss those. So this is a physiology that will regulate the food intake, the digestion and everything your appetite. So you need to pay attention. I won't waste much time because it's just a short lecture. So I, I hope I'll be able to finish. So let's start without wasting time. So there are certain terminologies that you need to understand as a student, starting with satiation. So satiation is the feeling of satisfaction. Satiation is the feeling of satisfaction. So when you are eating, you start getting satisfied with the food that you are eating. So that process of you feeling satisfaction is called satiation. So it's a process. And the fullness that occurs during a meal and stop eating. So this satiation is the fullness that you feel as you are eating. Then when you are full, you will stop eating. So satiation determines how much food is consumed during a meal. So satiation is going to determine how much food you are going to eat. Because that process, when the moment you feel full, then you stop eating. The process of you starting to feel full, that is called satiation. But how is it different from satiety? Satiety. So satiety, which is different from satiation. So satiety is the feeling of fullness. Satisfaction that occurs after a meal. And inhibits eating. So it's going to inhibit eating until the next meal. So satiety, satiety is the feeling of fullness after a meal. So when you stop eating, what you're going to have there is called satiety. So now you are satisfied. So that is going to inhibit you to eat until the next meal. As long as you have satiety, you are not going to have the desire to eat again because you are full. So satiety is going to provide time between the meals. Then once satiety is somehow reducing, then you start to feel hungry again. Then you would want to eat another meal. So satiety is going to determine how much time is going to pass between the meal. So between meals, how much time is going to pass? Satiety is going to provide for that. So the physiology of feeding, so feeding is the placement of food in the mouth and the treatment of food in the oral cavity. So the placement of the food and the treatment of the food in the oral cavity that is called eating or feeding. So there is mastication. Mastication is the physical breakdown of food and swallowing. Swallowing is also referred to as deglutition. So swallowing is deglutition. You now swallow the food into the esophagus all the way to the stomach. So the swallowing process is commonly divided into the oral phase, 
the pharyngeal phase and the esophageal phase or stages of swallowing. So the mechanism of swallowing is divided into phases or stages. We have the oral stage, the pharyngeal stage, and also the esophageal stage. And these stages are according to the location of the bolus. So if the bolus is still in the oral cavity, it's called the oral phase of swallowing. If it has moved into the, the pharynx, it's called the pharyngeal stage of swallowing. If it has moved into the esophagus, then it's called the esophageal stage of swallowing. So it's a well-coordinated process that is complicated, but you need to understand as a student because there are diseases that can affect swallowing. Then it will also bring about issues with respiration because if you don't swallow very well, the ingester can move into, or the bolus can move into the trachea, the fluids can move into the trachea. That will also bring about respiratory issues. So you need to understand the mechanism of swallowing. So regulation of food intake, how is food regulated? How much food you're going to take or how, how are you going to stop eating when you start eating? So ingestion of food is determined by the intrinsic desire of the person for food. This is called hunger. So hunger is the intrinsic desire of a person for food. So you have this desire to say, I need to eat. So that desire is called hunger. So it's a process. So hunger is a physiological response to a need for food caused by nerve signals and chemical messengers originating and acting in the brain. So you have chemical messengers that are originating or they are produced elsewhere in the body, but they are acting in the brain. Which part of the brain? It's the hypothalamus. So I've told you to say the hypothalamus, that's where you have the hunger centers. So there are hormones of the hypothalamus that will promote thoughts of eating. So there are certain hormones that can just encourage you to eat. So those are going to be stimulating the hunger center, which is a lateral hypothalamic nucleus. And then you feel the need, the intrinsic desire to eat, okay? Then you also have appetite. So appetite is a desire for a particular type of food. So the type of food the person is going to prefer to eat at that particular time is called appetite. So you just want to eat carbohydrates. You just want to eat meat or proteins. You just want to eat milk or proteins. Sometimes you just have the fuel to eat fat, okay? So you find that that appetite, that will give you the specific type of food that you want to eat. It's also controlled by the hypothalamus, the different types of food that you would want to eat. So when there are no food for many hours, the stomach undergoes intense rhythmic contraction which are called hunger contractions so if the stomach is empty you agree with me to say that there are contractions that you can actually feel to say that the stomach is contracting in those contractions if you're not eating anything they become painful so you have the pain contraction or the tight feeling of the stomach that will cause pain and this pain is called the hunger pangs so the hunger pangs are pain due to the severe contraction of the stomach when it's empty. So it's just want to send a strong signal to your conscience to say that I am empty. Can you eat something to fill me up? Otherwise, if you're not eating, those contractions will continue. Okay, that's why you find people can steal food. Why is because of hunger? Because sometimes the hunger can influence you to do something that you don't want to do that intrinsic desire to eat is so strong to the extent that you can't resist it then if you're not eating you end up if you don't have money to buy food you end up stealing just to fill the stomach or you can end up killing your friend you consume your friend just because you are hungry we've heard stories in the bible whereby there was a famine and then a lot of people were so hungry they couldn't find what to eat and then they started they started eating their own children why it's because of the hunger pangs it's a painful sensation so you are so hungry that you there is even pain in the stomach you have no option but just to find something to eat you can eat anything okay <clears throat> then after a meal satiety is developed so after a meal satiety is now developed this means that the feeling of fullness and satisfaction that occurs after a meal, and it's going to inhibit eating until the next meal. So satiety is going to determine 
how much time will pass between meals, like I've already mentioned. So the feeling of satiety continues to suppress the hunger and allows a person not to eat again for a while. So you're not going to eat again for a while. Why? It's because satiety is inhibiting hunger. So you're not going to feel hungry for you to eat again. Okay. So there are certain individuals whereby the hunger centers are compromised. So they, they don't feel hungry. So if they don't feel hungry, they'll start wasting. They'll start losing weight. Why? It's because they don't feel the need to eat. Maybe the hunger centers are destroyed or they are not functioning very well. Then there are also certain individuals whereby the satiety centers are not functioning very well. You find that they always have this desire to eat. They can eat as much as they can, but they don't feel satisfied. Why? It's because there's no satiety. The satiety centers are destroyed. So just continuously be eating, eating, and then they'll become obese. Okay, so you need to know all that. So during the course of a meal, as food enters the GIT, the hunger diminishes, satiation develops, then you stop eating. As receptors in the stomach stretch and hormones such as cholecystokinin become active, the person begins to feel full. The response, satiation occurs and the person stops eating. So this is now the process of satiation. As you are eating, the, the stomach becomes full. As the stomach is being filling, there are stretch receptors that are being stimulated that will stimulate the production of hormones like polycystokinin and other hormones. And this will go and inhibit the hunger center. They are going to stimulate the satiety center so that now you start feeling satisfied with the food that you are eating. Then the moment you are satisfied, then satiety sets in. You stop eating until the next meal. So this is the regulation of food intake, hunger, and satiety. So you can see that there is, if you are hungry, so hunger tells you to start eating. So the intrinsic desire will tell you to start eating. Then you become aware to say, I need to eat. Then you start looking for something to eat. You buy or you prepare food, then you start eating. As you are eating, there is suggestion. Suggestion will tell you now to stop eating because suggestion is a process by which now you are satisfied with what you are eating. Once the, moment, uh, the stomach is filled up, there are stretch receptors that are going to be stimulated. Then there will be hormones that will be produced. Then that will send a signal to the brain to say that the stomach is full, stop eating. At that moment, you feel full, you feel satisfied, you stop eating. Once you stop eating, what you have is satiety. So satiety is going to tell you that now you are satisfied. You don't need to eat. So it will provide time between meals. So satiety is a satisfaction between meals. So between the meals, you have satiety. Then when satiety is winding out, then you're going to start feeling hungry now. So now you are getting hungry. So when you're getting hungry now, the hunger will grow. Then it will tell your brain now to say you need to eat something. So this is a cycle the regulation of fit intake. So at a certain point, you feel hungry, you eat, you feel satisfied, satiety. Then after some time, you feel hungry again, you need to eat. So now we are looking at neural centers for regulation of food intake in the hypothalamus. So I've already told you to say, there is a region within the, the, the brain, which is called the hypothalamus. So it's called the hypothalamus is because it's just a location below the thalamus. So we have two thalami. So below the two thalami, we have the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is the one that is responsible for regulation of food intake. So you have two nuclei there. Okay, because I've already mentioned, I won't waste time. So we proceed. So what is the input to the hypothalamus? I've already told you to say you have two centers. We have the hypothalamic nucleus, that is the hunger center. When it's stimulated, you feel the intrinsic desire to eat. Then you also have the ventral medium hypothalamic nuclei that is responsible for satiety. So satiety, you feel satisfied once that center has been stimulated. So there are two centers. 
So it's either the hunger center is being stimulated more or the satiety center is being stimulated more. That would be the control. But the stimulation of these two nuclei is facilitated by certain hormones produced by the hypothalamus itself or certain hormones that are coming from the GIT, like the cholecystokinin, the ghrelin hormone, the leptin hormone that is coming from adipose tissue or fats. All those hormones, they will have an effect on the hypothalamus to control food intake. So what information is feeding into the hypothalamus to control feed, uh, to control food intake? So these are the information that you need to know. So the hypothalamus is going to receive information from different parts of the body. So we have the neural signals from the GIT that will provide sensory information about stomach feeling. I've already told you to say the stomach, you have the stretch receptors that are responding to the feeling of the stomach. So as the stomach is getting filled with the ingester or the bolus, the stretch receptors will be stressed. And then it will generate an information that will be propagated to, this, to the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus will get the information to say the stomach is feeling. So you find that the hunger center now will be inhibited. The satiety center will be stimulated. So once the stomach is filled up with food, then the hunger center will be inhibited. Then the satiety center will be stimulated. Then you feel the satisfaction to say, okay, I've eaten enough. I stop eating. Okay. So there is neural signals that, it, that is coming from the GIT itself. Then you have the chemical signals from the nutrients in the blood. So the nutrients that you are eating, after digestion, there's absorption of glucose, there's ab absorption of amino acids, there's absorption of fatty acids. So these monomers in the blood, they can also go and send a signal to the hypothalamus to say there's enough glucose. You've eaten enough of carbohydrates. Can you stop eating? There's enough of amino acids. You've eaten enough of proteins. Can you stop eating? There's enough of fatty acids. You've eaten enough of lipids. Can you stop eating? So that is going to signal the satiety center to say you are now satisfied. Stop eating. So there are chemical signals that are also coming from the nutrients that you are eating. Then you also have signals that are coming from the GIT. GIT hormones. So the GIT hormones, these are the cholecystokinin, the gastrin hormones, the ghrelin hormones that will have an effect on the hunger center and satiety center. The hypothalamus is also receiving signals from the hormones released by adipose tissue. This is leptin hormone. So leptin hormone is released by adipose tissue that will have an effect on the satiety center. So it can go and stimulate the satiety center and inhibit the hunger center. Then signals that are coming from the cerebral cortex, like sight of nice food, smell of nice food, taste of nice food, that can also have an influence on feeding behavior. What do I mean? When you go to a restaurant, uh, a restaurant that prepares very nice food, just before you get there, they smell the food. If you're near Hungry Lion, just a smell of food, who enhance your appetite or to stimulate your hunger center. You feel like eating the hungry round chicken and chips. And sometimes, you know, to say just a sight of food, when you just see the packaging for hungry lion, you just feel like eating. Why is it? Because the sight of nice food can also stimulate the hunger center so that you eat. Then when you're given a bite for hungry lion, the moment you taste it, you would want to eat more of it. Why? Because taste can also enhance your hunger center. So this information is coming from special senses like the taste buds, the olfactory uh, nerves that is in the, in the nose, and then you also have sight optic nerve. So from these special senses, they will gather information that is outside. Then they will send it to the cortex, the higher center. So the cerebral cortex will process that information. Then it will send another information to the hypothalamus to regulate the food intake in the hypothalamus. <clears throat> so these are the two centers, the lateral hypothalamus and the ventral medial nuclei of the hypothalamus. So the hunger and the satiety centers, the hypothalamus gland is responsible for hunger and satiety, like I've already explained. So the lateral hypothalamus stimulation causes a person to eat a lot, while this is the hunger center. 
if you are stimulating the ventral medial nuclei, then you feel satisfied because you have now that satisfaction that is taking place, the situation that is taking place within you. Okay, so you can see the hypothalamus there is responsible to control a lot of things, especially autonomic uh, nervous system. So you're talking of temperature control, water balance, eating behavior, you know, secondary respiratory center, those are found in the medulla oblongata and the pons. But just not to say that the hypothalamus is responsible for regulation of a lot of autonomic function of the body. So the two nuclei, you have the lateral hypothalamic area or nucleus, and then you also have the ventral medial nucleus. So the ventral medial is the third center. The lateral hypothalamic nucleus, this is the uh, hunger center. So destructive lesions or trauma of the lateral hypothalamus causes complete lack of desire for food. So when the hunger center is destroyed, maybe you are involved in a road accident or whatever it is, maybe it was stroke, then the neurons in the uh, lateral hypothalamus has been destroyed, then the hunger center will be compromised. So you won't feel hungry to eat, then you start losing weight. There will be no appetite, there will be no desire to eat. But if the distraction is in the ventral medial, so you have destructive lesions in the ventral medial nuclei, then it means that you won't feel satisfied. So you find that you eat a lot. So you're going to gain excessively. So you become obese to some extent. So this is an experiment. When you destroy the lateral hypothalamic area, you find that you become anorexia. Anorexia, it means that there is no appetite. You don't want to eat anything. That's anorexia. Then you start losing weight. And then if you have a rat whereby the ventral medial nuclei has been destroyed, so the cetat center has been destroyed, then you don't feel the need to stop eating. You always have this desire to eat. You don't feel satisfied to some extent. So the hunger center is being stimulated. The cetat center is not being stimulated. So at every time you're feeling hungry to eat something. So you only have appetite to eat, but you don't know when to stop eating. So you'll be eating and eating and eating until you become obese. But under normal circumstances, there is control of fit intake between hunger and satiety. So if hunger is stimulated, you start eating. Satiety is going to be stimulated, you stop eating. Then with time, satiety will start be reducing. Then you feel hungry again, you start eating. So that's a normal regulation of fit intake. At a certain time, you need to feel hungry. Then at a certain time, you need to feel satisfied after eating. Then you spend a bit of time without eating. Then you, the hunger center will be stimulated more again. You eat. So that's the cycle. Okay, so I've already explained the, the centers for hunger. But you, you also need to know that there are also other areas of the hypothalamus that are responsible for hunger or to control, to activate. So here you have areas like amygdala, amygdala, and also other cortical areas of the limbic system. They are coupled with the hypothalamus. So they are also involved in feeding mechanisms. Okay, so the amygdala in the cortical areas are responsible for that, apart from the hypothalamus that I've already explained. So you can see the human amygdala. Okay, so you can see in this diagram, you have the amygdala that is responsible for hunger also. It's the limbic system. It's part of the limbic system. So destruction of amygdala can also increase or inhibit feeding behavior in, in people and also destruction of certain cortical areas of the limbic system can also result into an increase or decrease in feeding activities. So these are other centers that can also work in hand with the hypothalamus. So the amygdala, of the limbic system and the cortical areas of the limbic system is also responsible for that. Okay, so never mind. So, what are the factors that will regulate food intake? So, these are also other factors that can regulate food intake. So, we have eight minutes, I think we'll be done very soon. So, some of the factors that will regulate food intake, they are divided into <clears throat> factors which are nutritional factors. So nutritional regulation, these are also referred to as metabolic regulation. So they are concerned with maintenance of normal quantities of nutrients stored in the body. So normal quantities of glucose, normal quantities of 
fatty acids or free fatty acids, normal quantities of amino acids. So these are there to maintain normal quantities. This is where the endocrine system also comes in. You know the function of insulin and glucagon that will maintain the levels of glucose. So all that. So what you're looking at is the nutritional factor, which is glucose. Okay. So the factors that control the degree of activity of feeding center or the hypothalamus. So these are some of the factors. The first one, a decrease in blood glucose concentration is associated with the development of hunger. So if you are becoming hypoglycemic, so hypoglycemia is going to enhance hunger center. So a decrease in glucose concentration is associated with development of hunger because that would mean that your NH levels are reducing. You need glucose. So if the glucose is reducing, the hunger center will be stimulated so that you eat a lot of carbohydrates to increase the glucose levels in your system or in your body. So this mechanism is called glucostatic regulation theory of hunger and feeding regulation. Glucostatic, meaning that you're looking at the glucose itself. So glucostatic, you need to maintain glucose within the normal range. Otherwise, if it's getting out of normal range, if there's an increase more than what is required, then you feel satisfied. If there's a decrease less than what is required, then you feel hunger. You need to eat again. So the effect also, you also have the effect of blood amino acids, concentration on feeding, and increase in the concentration of amino acids is going to reduce the feeding activity because it would mean that you've eaten enough. You have a lot of amino acids in circulation. You already have enough energy levels, so you don't need to eat again. So with an increase in amino acids, then the hunger center is going to be inhibited, the satiety center is going to be stimulated. We also have an effect on fat metabolism. So fat metabolism, here is the function of leptin. So I've told you to say fat, adipose tissue can produce leptin, and leptin can go and stimulate the hunger center. So as the quantity of adipose tissue increases, the rate of feeding decreases. This is, this is caused by a negative feedback regulation. Because if you have more fat, you are producing more leptin. And that leptin will inhibit the hunger center. It will stimulate the satiety center so that you feel satisfied. Otherwise, if you continue eating, a lot of that food stuff will be converted into fat. Then you start gaining, you become obese. Then the body temperature has got an effect on feed intake. So body temperature and feed intake interrelationship, when it's very cold, people will eat a lot when it's very cold. When it's very hot, they'll eat just a bit of food stuff. So what is the relationship there? It's because when it's very cold, you need to increase the metabolism of the body to produce heat to keep your body warm. So when it's very cold, people will eat a lot they will have this desire to eat so that what they are eating is being metabolized and then there will be production of heat after that. But when it's already hot, you don't want to produce a lot of heat. So you want to decrease your metabolism. So you find that the hunger is going to be inhibited so that you don't eat a lot. Eating a lot means there's a lot of metabolism taking place that will result into production of heat. So it's already hot outside. You don't need to eat a lot. So you find that when it's very hot, the appetite to eat is no longer there. But when it's very cold, you, you eat a lot. Okay. Then you have non-metabolic regulation, like the habit. So you just have the habit of eating maybe chocolate. Not necessarily that you are hungry or what, but you just feel like eating chocolate. That, that becomes a habit maybe. You just like eating chocolate. Sometimes you also have gastrointestinal feeding. These are stretch receptors, which I've already explained. Then the hormonal control, you have leptin. Leptin was discovered in 1994, and it's released by the adipose tissue. So it's going to, to be enhanced by insulin because leptin is associated with high energy levels. So it's going to inhibit the hunger center, like I've already explained. So if, to some extent, the hunger center is resistant to leptin, you find that if there is resistance, the leptin is also going to stimulate the satiety center so that you feel satisfied. So if there is resistance, leptin won't go in and stimulate the satiety center. So you won't feel the need to stop eating if there is resistance to leptin. So there are certain obese people 
whereby they have been found with the higher circulating leptin levels, which are resistant to some extent. So they are not stimulating the cetat center to some extent. Okay, so this leptin is going to act on the, thalam the hypothalamus to decrease the food intake and to increase energy consumption. So cetat center is going to be stimulated. The hunger center is going to be inhibited. And then it's going to increase the energy consumption because leptin is associated with high energy levels in the body. So you need to increase energy consumption. So abnormalities in leptin signaling appear to be correlated to overeating and obese. So if to some extent leptin is not working very well, then you start overeating and then you become obese, of course, there's obesity. Ghrelin is another hormone that was discovered in 1999. So it's called the hunger hormone. Why is it? Because it's produced by the stomach and it goes to the brain to stimulate the hunger center. So when the stomach is empty, there are ghrelin producing cells that will produce ghrelin and that ghrelin will go to the hypothalamus. How does it get to the hypothalamus? Of course, it's through, it's through the bloodstream. So there is a transportation of ghrelin to the hypothalamus and then when it gets to the hypothalamus, is going to stimulate the hunger center. So you feel hungry. So the intrinsic desire to eat is going to increase with breathing. So it's a peptide hormone that is secreted by gastric mucosa on an empty stomach. And during fasting, this hormone increases because now you're increasing the desire to eat. Okay, so breathing is going to be produced more during fasting. That is going to overstimulate the hunger center. That's why when you are fasting, the hunger is so much because of some of this hormone. Orexin is another hormone. Orexin is also called hypocretins. So the hypocretin, which is orexin, is another hormone. It's a neurotransmitter hormone that is produced by the hypothalamus. So that is going to enhance the production, I mean, uh, to stimulate the hunger center. So it's uh, synthesized in the neurons located in the lateral hypothalamus. So it's produced by the hypothalamus. So the orexin are going to, are going to be inhibited by leptin and then they are going to be activated by ghrelin. So orexin is going to stimulate your hunger center so that you take in a lot of food. Okay, so it's produced by the hypothalamus. So if it's produced by the hypothalamus, it's going to be inhibited by leptin because leptin you don't want to eat. If you have gradient, it means you want to eat. So the orexin itself is going to be inhibited by leptin, but it's going to be activated by gradient in case of hypoglycemia. So these are appetite hormones or hormones that are regulating the food intake. So you have insulin. Insulin is secreted by the pancreas. It's also going to control blood glucose level. So if it's going to control blood glucose level, is involved in glucostatic mechanism of hunger. Leptin, I've already explained. Orexin, gradin, I've already explained. And then you also have polypeptide Y. So polypeptide Y, it's also a digestive tract hormone that will send, I'm hungry, I'm not hungry signal. So polypeptide Y is produced when you've eaten enough. So it's going to, to inhibit the hunger center to some extent. So these are some of the hormones that will have an effect on the hunger center and cetat center, okay? So some of them are inhibitory, some of them are stimulatory. So the hunger center, you can see the gradient is stimulatory to the hunger center. Then you have other hormones that are inhibitory. So inhibitory cholecystokinin, gastric inhibitory peptide, then GLP-1, then you also have other hormones like PYY, insulin, and leptin. These are inhibitory. So these are some of the hormones that will have an effect on the hunger center, which I've already explained. Even in this diagram here, it's just talking about grading, and I've already explained how grading is going to, in, uh, to stimulate the hunger center. So this is the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus, you have neurons. You have those that are going to encourage eating and those that are going to discourage eating. So those that are going to encourage eating, they are, go, they are called orex, orexigenic neurons. And those that are going to inhibit eating, they are called anorexigenic neurons. So the orexigenic neurons, of course, they are inhibited by PYY, they are stimulated by grelin, then they are also going to be inhibited by leptin. 
but they are oxygenic neurons, which are acetate centers. They're going to be stimulated by leptin. They're going to be stimulated by insulin. So you know to say that these are going to enhance the situation so that you stop eating. So it's basically one and the same information. Okay, then you have the acetate center, the hunger center. So of course, they are, they are neuro, um, if these are neurotransmitters or hormones, they have specific receptors they're going to attach to. Okay, but for now, just understand which hormones are stimulating hunger center, which hormones are inhibiting the hunger center, which hormones are stimulating the acetate center, and which hormones are stimulating or inhibiting the cetat center. So when you have that information, then that's good enough. We don't really need to go into details to explain the, the receptors that are found there, the neurons that are found there, the agouti related polypeptides, you know, all these things uh, you don't need to mention, okay? So for now, I think we're going to end here due to our time. So <clears throat> our time is up, but you should find time to look at the eating disorders at your own time. Go and read on aloxia, anorexia, nervosa, the bulimia. So these are disorders, eating disorders. So there are certain people who do not want to eat. You find that they'll start fasting so that they lose weight. So that is a condition, anorexia, nervosa. Then you have bulimia, whereby there are certain individuals after eating, they are going to stimulate, they are going to induce vomiting so that whatever they eat, they vomit so that they don't gain weight. So all those are conditions. We also have compulsive exercise. They are just addicted to exercise. They feel like if they stop exercising, they will gain weight. So they are always exercising. So these are some of the eating disorders that you are going to read on your own. Okay, so this is more like your assignment that you're not going to submit, but you're going to read for your own information. So read about disorders affecting eating behavior we are done unless if there's a question 